I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Marshall Islands to introduce an address by the head of state. Thank you, Mr. President. My small delegation warmly congratulates you on your election as president of the 76th session. Mr. President, I have the honor to introduce the statement of His Excellency David Kabua, President of the Republic of the Marshall Island. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, it is my great pleasure to bring you the warm greetings of Yahweh from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Small and vulnerable nations, such as my own, are in dire need of a stronger United Nations. While we are not naive to the typical challenges facing us all, we cannot forget that the UN was created not only to be inclusive of global diversity, but also to ceaselessly work to achieve common ideals of democracy, free and secure societies, and basic universal human rights. If we cannot remember the mistakes which led to the last century's open global military conflicts, then my fear is that we are doomed to repeat them. Leadership must come from all who are committed to act, small and large nations alike. We cannot abide by attempts to rewrite the script on universal human rights. And my own Pacific Islands region faces an emerging security threat in the form of geopolitical competition by the world's largest powers. Are we again to be caught in the middle of a tug of war? Throughout my nation's young history, we have remained true to the pursuit of an independent and free democracy, which assure a basic and individual human rights. Even as we tackle steep development challenges, as island leaders, we must remain firmly in control of our commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific and stand apart from any who would seek to have us trade our core values for easy inducement. I welcome the recent Japan-Pacific Islands Defense Dialogue as a key confidence-building measure against authoritarian influence. Yet, it is an open question if the UN and international community can adequately speak to this emerging threat, and if our closest traditional partners can answer our call with a true partnership which goes beyond, well beyond media statement, but which makes a dramatic difference in our local communities. Mr. President, the Marshall Islands remains committed to building a stronger Pacific Islands region, one which can answer to these deep challenges to democracy, security, and development, including the threats of rising seas upon our low-lying atoll nation. Yet, the means to address this must be through institutions which place our voices and leadership aspiration equal among others. We cannot take a back seat to our own affairs. Even as the Marshall Islands is currently transitioning away from the Pacific Islands Forum, under the final authority of our parliament, we also are committed more than ever to join action which advances democracy, security, and human rights in our own region. In this regard, I welcome the strengthening of the Micronesian President Summit in the North Pacific, and we look forward to forcing a common voice which addresses emerging security threats and directly reflects the shared values of our cultures and democratic constitutions. Mr. President, I support the firm commitment by the UN Secretary General to advance UN system reform discussions into clear management action. I want to underscore the urgent need for tangible and text-based efforts towards UN Security Council reform. I am particularly pleased to support the opening later this year of a new UN multi-country office in the Federated States of Micronesia, dedicated to serve the five North Pacific Island countries. This is a vital opportunity to strengthen the fragile bridge between national and global goals 
and affords the international system a key opportunity to focus on the unique structure of our nations. We welcome the increased focus by the United Nations and commit to doing our part to better integrate UN-level assistance into national planning and implementation. In particular, I also emphasize the importance of including practical assistance to address nuclear testing impacts within the upcoming UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. Mr. President, we gather at the United Nations still in the midst of the global pandemic on COVID-19. The international community still faces deep challenges to upscale international cooperation to supply and distribute vaccines, particularly to the most vulnerable peoples. However, I am pleased to report our own robust success towards the goal of achieving vaccination of nearly every eligible person in our nation. In particular, I wish to thank the United States of America for its strong and early outreach to ensure that the Marshall Islands was not left behind in vaccination efforts. We proudly remain COVID-free, even as future risks remain great. However, our borders remain largely closed as we lack the full capacity to address the potential of even small outbreaks. While our core economic driver of fisheries is only starting to recover, our nation remains forced to cut back efforts in core development areas at a time when we clearly should have been moving forward. It is vital that the international system continue to strengthen efforts to social and economic impacts of COVID measures in small and remote island nations. Mr. President, climate change remains the greatest threat to the security and well-being of our region, especially to low-lying atoll nations like my own. We simply have no higher ground to see. The tireless leadership of small island developing states and wider circles of partners makes clear that an overwhelming global majority demands the Paris Agreement must be delivered in action, not empty words. This year's conference of parties to the UNFCCC offers a vital opportunity for the world to make good on the promises of the Paris Agreement to raise ambition. We remain in support of the United Kingdom's leadership as host, no matter the challenges posed by the global pandemic. We have put forward our own commitment for stronger action, both on our own national commitments, on emission and adaptation, as well as expectations for meaningful leadership by the international maritime sector for greater ambition. But we cannot act alone. This year is the moment to rebuild higher ambition, and the world especially, the most vulnerable, cannot afford failure to hold temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Earlier promises of stronger climate finance remain unfulfilled, and even if delivered, must be far more accessible to those most in need. As sea levels continue to rise unabated, there is now an immediate threshold between unfulfilled promises and meaningful action. A special repertoire on climate change is needed to strengthen the focus and human rights lens on those most vulnerable. Where there are often no easy solutions, the world simply cannot delay climate ambition any further. Mr. President, the Republic of the Marshall Islands has our legacy roots as a strategic UN trusteeship, where despite our warnings at the time, two trusteeship council resolutions remain the only instance in history where any UN organ ever specifically authorized nuclear detonations. This was part of a wider nuclear weapons testing program of 67 atmospheric tests conducted by the United States as administering authority between 1946 and 1958, delivering the equivalent of 1.6 hiroshima size shots every day for 12 years. The legacy of these tests remain a very contemporary threat in our waters, our land, and our bodies. We have recently formed a National Nuclear Commission to coordinate effective responses, and we continue to view these impacts 
through a human right lens. Despite our commitment, we simply lack the capacity to fully address our local needs. We tirelessly underscore that no people or nation should ever have to bear a burden such as ours, and that no effort should be spared to move towards a world free of nuclear weapons and nuclear risk through any and all effective pathways. Mr. President, we welcome recent progress to restore the UN Ocean Summit now planned for next year to be co-hosted by Kenya and Portugal. We look forward to our Ocean Summit next year, hosted by Palau, as a nation whose wider territory is 99% ocean. Leadership is an undeniable priority. Global action on oceans cannot be limited only to piecemeal approaches. Far stronger political will is needed, and as large ocean nations, we are leading by example. Joined by our regional neighbors, we have defined our fixed maritime boundaries even in the face of rising seas. We have worked with the parties to the Nauru Agreement to move the world towards fully traceable and sustainable tuna stocks. As the world's largest tuna port, we have led with our own national action to spur sharp progress on COVID vaccination for foreign fishing crews. Together with the Foreign Fisheries Agency, we remain committed as a region to ensuring basic minimum social and human rights standards for the crew, observers, and vessels which face our waters and visit our ports. But this remains incomplete without the stronger commitment from distant water fishing nations, many of whom are also global superpowers. Human rights apply in the ocean without exception, just as much as they apply on land. Mr. President, more than 75 years after the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the world remains at a loss to turn these aspirations into realities. There are many complex rights situations around the world which deserve more careful attention and diplomacy than generic approaches they can afford. Yet far too often, nations seek to avoid accountability and try to hide behind political muscles or use sovereignty colonial legacies or development challenges as excuses for forced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, or to suppress basic political expression. This is simply not a win-win solution for anyone. On the basis of our own history and experience, we remain committed to ensuring the voices of the most vulnerable are better heard. The international community should have learned from far too many prior mistakes that politics must not cloud our judgment nor be a barrier to action. On Myanmar, the General Assembly has spoken loudly by adopting Resolution 75287 earlier this year with only one objection, urging the armed forces to halt lethal force and respect the free will of the people. In addition, the Marshall Islands is proud to have joined the cross-regional joint statements at the UN General Assembly and the Human Rights Council, expressing strong concern regarding human rights issues in the Xiangyang region of the People's Republic of China, as well as recent developments in Hong Kong. If a truly independent visit by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights still remains unscheduled, we would strongly encourage all available options to be pursued to deepen the SRC's analysis and assessment. Mr. President, the devastating global COVID pandemic demands collective actions from all countries, stakeholders, and peoples if we are to achieve a resilient recovery. The democratic government of Taiwan should be allowed to participate in an equal and dignified manner within the UN system, including the WHO, ICAO, and the UNFCCC, as well as activities related to the SDGs. There is absolutely nothing in General Assembly Resolution 2758 which prevents this inclusive approach, and this resolution affords nothing to hide behind, as it expresses no position on Taiwan as a people-centric institution, the UN cannot ignore the Taiwanese people 
or continue to use their nationality, we exclude them from attending public meetings or public tours of its headquarters. The shameful silence must end. Mr. President, to effectively address the grave challenges before us all, the international community needs stronger leadership and true commitment to human rights and security. It is evident to all that a major course correction is required to rebuild political trust and cooperation. Yet, this challenge also offers a vital opportunity to reshape the world closer to the common values of democratic freedom embedded in the UN Charter. Thank you, and kumol dada. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Marshall Islands for the statement just made.